Are you ready to invest in yourself today? Welcome to the Wealth Builders Podcast. Where investment leader Billy Epperhart teaches you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom. Scripture says in Deuteronomy 8.18, Remember the Lord, your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. At Wealth Builders, our goal is to teach you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom in your finances, your business, and your investments. Now, let's join Billy Eberhardt. So that's just something that people just don't think. They don't, because either they don't know how, how to do it, and that's what we're talking about this weekend. And so that's one of the key things that I really want to show you and teach you is these tax benefits are absolutely tremendous. Now, a lot of people want to know what is a 1031 exchange. And so I just want to show you here, we have a lot of information to cover, but I just want to give that to you. <clears throat> it's what's called a like chain, a like kind exchange. And it's where all property types held for productive use in a trade or a business are for an investment. And so we have that slide there for you. There's a 45-day rule. You must identify the next property within 45 days of closing on the previous property. Then there's a 180-day closing, which is basically six months. That's the time in which you must close on your new acquisition property from the closing of your disposition property. And then there are some escrow restrictions. Of course, the escrow agent has to be independent. And then what I like here is trading up. It says you must trade basically for a property of equal or greater value. So one of the things is, is I know people that have actually changed different kinds of properties as long as the value of properties are different. So this is something that is absolutely critical and key uh, to us. Now, there's another thing that you can do with the 1031 exchange is in what we call, it's called a charitable remainder trust, so that when you get a trust, sorry, so you get to the end of your life, you can roll all of your 1031 exchanges into a charitable, rain, cha charitable remainder trust. Now, you do have to take money out of the trust, but that really minimizes what your tax exposure is. Now, another tax benefit besides the 1031 that we talked about is... Um, what I call primary residence rules. And that's where the government, if you own your own house, you actually can get a $500,000 capital gains exemption. You'll see that here on the screen that we have and on your screen. You must live in the home uh, that you're in two of the last five years. And here's the good news. You can also purchase a second home you can use as a vacation home and you have to live in it two of the last five years, but you can actually receive a capital gains exemption on the second home. So what that means is if you buy your primary residence and you decide to sell it, and let's say you caught the market good, you actually have what we call a, pri a primary residence exemption. And I'll talk about vacation property some more uh, probably on Sunday and kind of show you how to use this strategy. But I'm just showing you some of the benefits, pardon me, that you receive from uh, actually purchasing property on your taxes. And then there's another one that I'm going to deal with in more detail later, and it's called getting the real estate professional designation. In order for you to be able to accomplish what I talked about, owning the 30 homes and getting $100,000 a year tax-free, for example, you would have to have what's called a real estate, not a real estate agent, a real estate professional. And a couple of those rules are because I, I'm, I'm working on my new book, Real Estate Mastery, to have it to the publisher by Monday, and uh, this coming Monday. And one of the things that, that I write in the book here about the real estate professional designation is that the rule that you have to have is you basically need to be spending about 750 hours a year on developing your real estate portfolio. Most people who are buying 30 homes can easily qualify for that rule. And then the ownership rule and the 50% participation rule, all those rules you would qualify for, which means that you basically get unlimited write-offs when it comes to 
your real estate. And so that's just a huge thing that I want to show you and let you know. Tack, we're going to come back to that later in more detail. Then the other one is what I call equity buildup. And this is like a forced savings account. And I put another chart for you to see that came from the last one that I showed you. And I want you to just see if we go back to buying the $100,000 property a year that we showed you earlier, only one. And we come across here, every year you're going to be paying because of low interest rates now. Because of low interest rates, your principal reduction is going to be greater per loan that you get on these properties. And your total equity buildup, for example, in this property here, total equity would be $6,600. So the tenant is making your payment, and they're reducing, as we go down the line here, they're reducing what you owe on the house and also increasing what your equity would, would be. So I put these in color so you can see graphically what this looks like. And so basically, it's like putting $1,600 a year into a savings account because you're paying down the principal on that house. So this is a huge thing that works can work as, a, as an advantage. Now, remember, you still got to manage the property, but I'm showing you the financial side of what this actually can do. And then the next reason that I like real estate is because of control. Now, I don't mean controlling somebody's life, but I mean do mean controlling the asset that you own. Real estate is one, for example, and we're going to tell you several times over the course of this workshop that you, in real estate, you make money when you buy, not when you sell. Let me say that one more time. You make money when you buy, not when you sell. So one of the things is you can do in this control part is you can learn to purchase below market value for what I call instant equity. So in other words, you can, you can look for property. And let me, let me say this, and I'll teach this too, but don't get emotionally attached to property, especially investment property. Now listen, in where we live, and, and uh, we have a home in Denver, and we have a home here now in Woodland Park because of my, my uh, new role as CEO at at Andrew Walmack Ministries, and um, well, when we're looking at homes to buy that my wife is going to live in, she will get emotionally attached to certain things in those properties, and so sometimes I have to pay a little extra for that emotional attachment. However, when I'm buying property for investment purposes, the truth of the matter is I don't have to be emotionally invested in the property. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't be. And really, you need to have a nice, clean, healthy condition for tenants to live in. But you don't have to put the latest, greatest decorator items and all the other stuff in those properties. And so, first of all, I want to say you've got to work on that. What You say, how come you're telling me that on purchasing? Because some people get so emotionally attached to a property, they end up overpaying for it. So you can't do that when it comes to investment property. And then... The other part I like is you can create value through a rehab. Now, I have a picture of this, of this property, and I listed it. This property right here, I actually, and I'll show you, I can show you the picture of it, but I don't have it in this set of slides. I paid $58,000, and this was actually a HUD rehab, and excuse me, a HUD foreclosure that I was going to rehab. And I ended up paying 58000 which was a, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, especially if you live in expensive areas. But I bought that house and I turned it into a duplex. I sold that house just about two years later for 135. Looking back, I should have never sold it. Uh, but I sold it for 135000 That doesn't sound like a lot of money either. But I made clear on that house after I paid everything, I made between thirteen and fourteen hundred a month in positive cash flow. And somebody says, "Well, duh, why did you sell it?" I sell, sold it because I felt like I was getting too much exposure in a particular area on my property. I wanted to be more spread out, and so I did really well on it. I made good money. I put that money into another property that actually did better. But this is an example where I took the rehab. I bought the house for this amount of money 
and I was able to rehab this property and turn it into a duplex for about 30 grand. So I ended up with uh, I ended up here with about 88,000 invested. And so I didn't make an enormous amount of money on this property. I'm going to show you some I have, by the way, and show you pictures. But in this one, I'm just showing you I took something that nobody else wanted, created value. Two years later, sold it to another investor who paid cash, by the way, uh, for that property. And I was able to roll that over into some other things that we were doing, inquiring more real estate. So then the other thing about it is you can rent it. So you don't have to sell it. I rented it. I gave I told you what that was and of course you can sell it so the control part of this and then you can refi it or pull it out another reason I like real estate is because it can be insured and some of you may or may not know this but you can also get insurance and it's all it's why it's a, when we talk about building your team having an insur a good insurance agent for investment property is critical okay and we'll talk about your team tomorrow building your team but real estate can be insured in addition to that, you can also insure against lost rents. If you have a flood or water or fire or whatever, and I had a property that I'm also going to show you a picture of, and I had a fire in the kitchen in that property, meaning a tenant did, and they paid me for six months of my rent, which it took me about three months to get it repaired the way it should be. Uh, usually I don't like to try to do those repairs more than about a month and like to be out. But in this case, it took about three months. They paid me six months rent, paid for all the repair costs of the fire that it cost because I had rent loss insurance on that property. So that's a critical thing. But you can also just insure the property, generally speaking. And, uh, you know, you can't do that in the stock market. You can't insure your losses. Real estate, you can insure if something happens hazard-wise or even loss of rents for hazard purposes and sometimes for other reasons, you can insure it. The next is other people's money. It's what OPM means. And, of course, we're going to give you some great detail on financing tomorrow. We're going to go into great depth. But in some instances, it's less today than it was uh, but I bought pro many properties uh, for basically a 100% loan. And the way you do that is you go find a property. Now, most banks, if you're first just getting started, they want to see you put your own money in it. <clears throat> they want to see what kind of income you have. They want to see what kind of credit you have. Once you establish a relationship and they know you're solid, you can go in and you can say you find a house that needs to be rehabbed. You buy it for less than it's worth. They send their appraiser, not your appraiser, out. They appraise the property for you and say, we will give you this much money on an as-repaired appraisal. And in some cases, many cases over the years, I have actually borrowed 100% to, now I had to build myself up. I had to build a certain level of wealth. I had to get to a certain level of income in order to do that, but I was able to purchase or purchase properties with none of my own money. Now, before you think I'm crazy, there are actually private lenders, individual lenders today, that will loan you 80% on the value of the property with a first mortgage on the property all day long. And if you know what you're doing and you can get into that property and rehab it for the as-repaired repraisal, for 80%, and I'm not telling you can in every property you look at, I am telling you it's possible. But here's the kicker, you can use other people's money, and we'll talk about that some more uh, in detail, but here's the partners. The partners can put 100% in if they want to, and then you share the profits with them. So there's ways to do it, and Bill Bronchek's gonna talk about other ways for financing. I'm gonna cover financing, Mike Davis is going to cover financing. So you're going to get a lot of that stuff tonight. We're just introducing you as we can to the concepts. Then the last reason I put down here is value. You can buy real estate for less than it's worth. So let me say it one more time. I've already said it once tonight. You always remember this. You make money when you buy, not when you sell. And I 
you know, I bought, you know, in this day and age, I don't invest, and I'll show you some of the properties I invest in, but I don't invest in properties anymore that are just in low to moderate neighborhoods. Now I invest more in luxury type properties. And you would think, and, I, and you would think in that category, if, if you, I like the category in Colorado that's somewhere between 750 and a million. Sometimes I'll go down as low as 500,000, buy properties in solid neighborhoods, and I rent them. Now, my cash flow gets a little tight, meaning not for me personally, but in my return, because I pay cash. So I pay cash. I don't borrow because I'm not building anymore. I'm holding my wealth. But here's the kicker with that. <clears throat> if you have cash, you can go in and make some incredible buys. <clears throat> I can't do that on first starter homes anymore, what we call starter homes. But the minute I start going to that higher market, I'm able to write cash offers <clears throat> on those properties. And it's incredible what sometimes you can get them for. <clears throat> Pardon me. And if you know what you're doing, then you're able to really increase the value of those properties. And by the way, I rent them and I can get a good price for renting them and get a good return on my money. Plus, in those kind of neighborhoods, if you do it right, you get good appreciation on the back end. And so the point is, I can buy real estate for less than it's worth. You can do that as a beginning real estate investor. You just have to get a little sharper and you have to start watching what you're doing, know what you're doing, get in the game. It'll make all the difference in the world. We hope you learned something of lasting value today from this Wealth Builders podcast. If you'd like any tools, teachings, or resources mentioned in the podcast, you'll find them online at wealthbuilders.org. Wealth Builders exist to teach you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom in your finances, your business, and your investments. The Wealth Builders podcast is produced by Celine Williams with music by Audio Jungle and narration by Greg Hunter. Wealth Builders is a nonprofit organization. We depend on your donations to keep this podcast running. Please consider donating to us on wealthbuilders.org. Do you want to take control of your financial future? At Wealth Builders, we believe that money is a tool God has entrusted us with to make a difference. Our 2021 Real Estate Workshop is designed to help you achieve your goals so that you can empower others. Learn best practices and strategies from Billy Epperhart and other experts in this three-day event, October 15th through 17th in Denver, Colorado. As one of our valued podcast members, you can get $200 off this conference and a free gift. Go to wbrealestate.online and use the code SUMMER21 for in-person tickets and Summer 21 Live for live stream tickets at checkout. But act fast, this deal is for a limited time only.